thank you so much for joining us today. My name is Yoshi Domoto. I am the executive director of the Japan America Society of Georgia, and so thrilled that you are joining us、uh, as we explore the secrets and power of the Toyota product production system, or TPS.、Uh, certainly, Georgia and Japan we have a very close relationship as Japan is the number one investor here in Georgia. Over 600 Japanese companies are here in our state that have invested over 11 billion dollars in our economy,、uh, and these companies、uh, employ about 36,000 people as well.、Uh, many of them manufacturing companies.、Uh, so certainly today's topic is very key、uh, to our Georgia companies and the Japanese companies that are doing business here. But now more than ever, sustainable management of business operations. Production processes and efficient logistics are really crucial in navigating our ever-changing world. And while the Toyota production system grew out of a need to optimize the assembly line and improve quality for manufacturing companies, the principles of TPS can actually be used with other business sectors and even in personal aspects of life too. So, but without further ado,、um, with, before we introduce our presenter, I would like to first of all thank、uh, the co-chair of our programs committee. Ms. Nozomi Morgan,、uh, Nozomi-san,、uh, actually helped connect our presenter、uh, with the Japan American Society today. So, Nozomi-san, thank you very much, and、uh, let us、uh, know who we have、uh, in store today. Yeah, absolutely. Well, thank you, Yosan, for the wonderful introduction, and welcome, everyone.、Uh, so happy to see so many、um, people here joining us today. We have an amazing, amazing guest.、Um, I'm going to go ahead and call him.、Um, Humbly, my colleague,、um, and he is one of the best of the best. You know, as a program committee, every year we come together and really discuss what we want to provide for the for our members and for our community. And、um, this year,、uh, we decided we really wanted to focus on TPS、um, Lean because we know,、um, as Yoshi-san has shared in the introduction, a lot of our members, our community here in in Georgia. Um, have a very heavy. We have a very heavy manufacturing background, but also、uh, lean TPS is something that is not only for manufacturing. It applies to almost any industry,、um, and um, and having its、um, uh, origin actually in the U.S. and then came, but went back to Japan, and it's now coming over to the states and now all over the world. It also has a.、Uh, I would say. A connection like that bridge that the, the Japan America Study is、um, as well. So、uh, we decided to do a three-part series, and our guest today is going to kick us off. And I know he was going to do it in the most amazing way. So without further ado, I am going to do, introduce our amazing speaker today.、Um, he is.、Uh, The, called the optimization optimization expert, and I know he's even not just an expert in optimization. More, there's so much more to him.、Um, but he's this,、uh, the CEO of Makoto Flow,、uh, Mr. DJ Duarte. So DJ, thank you so much for being here. We're so excited to have you tonight or this morning on in your side. He's actually joining in from Japan. So DJ, the stage is yours. ありがとうございます。皆さんよろしくお願いします。I、uh, just want to say thank you very much to both、uh, Yoshi-san as well as Nozomi-san for what a great introduction.、Uh, I'm humbled that、uh, those words came my way and that we have this opportunity today to talk about something that I am truly passionate about, and that is what we call the Toyota production system. Now, I'm not going to give you your traditional webinar,、uh, as、uh, Yoshi and Nozomi sort of alluded to. Uh, we are today. What we'd like to do is sort of have a four-part、uh, section of a presentation that allows you opportunity to provide your insight and maybe some of your challenges and maybe some of your thoughts on、uh, how to deploy, how to、uh, engage TPS in a variety of different industries. So I'm going to take a few minutes.、Uh, I'm going to have probably about three or four slides about myself, where I came from, why me. And then I'm going to roll right into、uh, the session as we've、uh, organized it for you today. We, we're calling it the three big、uh, big ideas, and you'll see that here in a moment. The second thing I'd like to say is, because this is more of a you know interactive kind of session, there's a little button on the bottom right with a smiley face on it. It says reactions, and during each one of those sections where we give you a,、uh, some time to ask questions. 
just go ahead and click on raise your hand. And if you if you click on raise your hand, what's going to happen is you're going to come right to where Yoshi is right now on the screen. Exactly. Just like where no no Nozomi is. And we'll know who's asking what. And then we can just have a dialogue for all of us to engage in. So uh, I'm not the guy that likes to say, oh, type your questions in at the last minute and we'll try to get to all of them at the end. No, we're going to try to get to them as we go through this uh, session. So with that. I welcome everybody here. I'm, I'm delighted to be here with the, the Japan American Society and, and sharing this topic. So I will share my screen now with the with the the presentation I'd like to share with you today. Yeah, I'm sure everybody is is having a wonderful evening there in Georgia. And you know, I miss the barbecue. I miss my friends that are living down in there. But at the same token, I'm over here in Japan and I, I get an opportunity to engage in this way. Um, let me just say from the outset that the way this all really happened is I, I had an opportunity to actually see a presentation from Nozomi, uh, from Nozomi-san. And when she sent that presentation to me, I was like, man, I'd like to really see what she does. And then it rolled into this Japan American Society of Georgia type of engagement. And so from that relationship, we've built to this point. And, and now I'd like to take a few moments to just say to all of you, again, thank you for joining us. The topic is basically the power of the production system, the Toyota production system. And I wanna focus specifically on three big ideas. And I don't wanna distort the, uh, all the other elements of it, but at the same token, I want you to understand how simple it can be to deploy this, this practice in any business that you have. And that's my goal for today. So first, a little bit about my company. Uh, we have 53 joint ventures around the world. And when I say joint ventures, I'm just talking about partners that we've uh, collectively organized to do very specific things. And uh, Makoto Flow itself has only two at the moment. We should have by the end of uh, 2021, uh, four, which will be an addition of Vietnam as well as the Philippines. Furthermore, we, we got a simple organized uh, a structure of, for our organization. It's, it's primarily focused on five basic things from optimization consulting, which is based on the Toyota production system, uh, to tours here to Japan. Obviously with the Corona, we're doing this virtually now. I just got done with uh, 26 European uh, 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 colleagues uh, going through various sites here in Japan. And then we have this coaching mechanism. I'm coaching 12 people globally now. And then we also have training and workshops that allow people to gain the, the necessary competencies and capabilities to sustain you know, a good TPS structure. But behind all of that as well, we have digital solutions that we offer. Uh, not that we're trying to sell those digital solutions. We're just saying that some, of, some organizations need to look over the mountains and across the oceans. And uh, some, some, you can do that pretty much from your, from your desk. Why me? Uh, you know, I, all I can say is it's because I enjoy what I do. Uh, sure, I, I've, I have the experiences of being in Japan for about 34 years and doing the same kind of engagement for that same period of time, but I've traveled the world. I spent some time in the United States Marine Corps, 11 years, four months, and two beautiful days. Uh, and as I departed and moved forward, I wanted to grow and, and help other organizations. And so I decided to do that. I have a passion for the local baseball team here called it Hiroshima Carp. So uh, last night was a great example. I, I went to one of their games and got to watch them win seven to two. Right. So it was a wonderful, wonderful engagement. And uh, I love to see the spark of people's eyes and how they uh, see the value of TPS and what it can do for their organizations as well as I'm also a, a ramen connoisseur. So if, if there's anything you wanna know about ramen, every place I go, I'm trying ramen. So uh, how did I become this, uh, this person that shares this knowledge? Well, it all started out in the early 1980s in where I learned from Dr. Deming. And I was actually in San Diego, California in what's called the Naval Rework Facility. And that in itself is humorous because they changed the name after his visit, because there's no such thing as rework in a good quality system. Um, but yeah, I, I got to do the red bead experiment. I got to do, you know, uh, statistical process control, the whole 
you know, system of profound knowledge is, is what I got trained in. And then I traveled around for the Department of Defense, actually doing optimization efforts. From there, one of those travels, I happened to be on a plane and guess who was sitting right next to me? Yep, Mr. Masaki Imai from the Kaizen Institute. And lo and behold, I would say somewhere in the neighborhood of 12 years later, I actually joined uh, the Kaizen Institute, but through a merger. I was in another consulting firm and uh, that consulting firm merged with Kaizen Institute Global and we became one whole. And then next thing you know, we're, we're, we're drinking champagne and, and playing uh, you know, chess and checkers and drinking tea with Mr. Masaki Imai. Uh, while I was in that organization, there was a person I came across because I was doing lots of engagements globally, and his name is Isayo Kato-san. And he's the, sort of the father of TWI within Toyota. And we went to Egypt, to Thailand, and various other countries uh, deploying the Toyota production system the way he did for Toyota many years prior. And so he opened up all of the North American plants, all of the uh, European plants. So he had a systematic way of making sure that everybody who learned about TPS learned it in, in this particular way. And I was fortunate enough to do that. And then most recently, about two and a half, maybe three years ago, I met up with this gentleman here by the name of Toshihiko Miyuta-san. He's only like uh, one hour away by Shinkansen. He's in Fukuoka, uh, in Fukuoka, Japan, which is Kyushu. And I said, you know what? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to write to this guy and see if we can just sit down and have coffee. And sure enough, he said, sure, let's do it. We sat down and he said, DJ-san, you know, over the years, I've met lots of consultants. Why do you know how to do exactly what I do? <laughs> and then I explained my history. So now we're really good friends. We, we actually go into different companies together as a bicultural kind of pre, uh, focus. So you have the, the Western as well as the, the Japanese, and it really works out well. Some of the companies I've worked with in the past, you can see some, some pretty good brand names. Uh, I guess what I'm most proud of is that uh, there's the, I've worked in about 17 different industries, and, and some of those being you know service as well as casinos, as well as uh, 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 health care, and so on. But the, the bigger ones, they want you in there because they're really looking at the operational side. And I guess I have the right uh, verbiage, the right uh, demeanor uh, to be able to convince them that we need to go not just on the operational side, because it's only 30% of truly the value you're generating. It's the other 70% that we need to get into, the transactional world, the administrative, the, what I call the heart of the house, yeah? So I've gotten a lot of these organizations to do that as well. And you can see some of the results that I've achieved uh, throughout those, uh, those organizations. And when I say these results here, this is what we actually shoot for. So when somebody says to me, DJ, can you come in and help with productivity and increasing it by five or 10%? In my mind, I'm already thinking 50. Yeah, so this is how we do things. So enough about me and my company and what we do. Um, let's get started on today's purpose. And that is really the three big ideas. And I think the best way forward here today is to agree on what is the challenge that we're facing. So uh, uh, many companies are re-emerging from this, this COVID uh, period. And what they're finding out is that COVID has changed the dynamics of business. And these are the common things that we have seen and that others have actually validated for us. Everyone from the Boston Consulting Group to uh, PricewaterhouseCoopers, as well as McKinsey, in the way they are uh, viewing uh, today's issues. So we got uncertainty and demand. That's very high right now. Uh, in, in some parts of uh, UK, steel is used to be, you know, a 60 to 90 day window. Now it's moved out to 320. So, you know, that uncertainty really breeds how you actually can plan and execute. Then there's customer behavior patterns that have changed. There's more online engagement. In fact, I think we can all agree that in the last 15 months, maybe us going into the digital world has gone even faster in those in that short period of time than it has in the previous 15 years. Yeah. So that's definitely stuff that we have to deal with. Um, you got supply chain issues, where things are moving from, from place to place. Uh, especially, you know, we probably heard about some of those chip issues that we have today. We have the volatile mar markets in the way that we don't know what they're going to do. And so that, that all those, uh, you know, bets that you sort of place in, in getting what you need, that changes, right, in the way you actually 
purchase those. And of course, as I talked, the digital solutions, and last but not least, the talent and the way we maximize the use of that talent uh, through this through this era. So these are these are some basic safe assumptions that I think we can all agree to. But what we'd like to do is actually look at these challenges as opportunities. And so I'd like for you to sort of think about what are some of your opportunities that you have in front of you at the moment? If it's unpredictability, I mean, that's a great way to look at a chance to make things better. Uh, I'm, I'm talking to a company right now in the Netherlands and they want to do a, a transformation of, of a green plant, right? A green site. And in doing so, they were like, listen, you know, we have all these activities that we have to, you know, move into this new greenfield site. When is a good time to do it? And my answer is always now, because you'll never find a better time to do it. When you have chaos, that's, that's an awesome opportunity, yeah, because you get to see the reality of situations. Second thing is, again, though, that remote, remote working models that are existing today. A lot of people want to get back into the office, but I don't think it's ever going to be go back to the normal. I don't think there's going to be these, you know, buildings filled with people like they used to. It's going to be a 50-50 sort of opportunity. You can work from home 50% of the time. You can work at the, the office 50% of the time. And I think that leads to uh, a bigger challenges that we face to create opportunities for sharing of information. And that's one of the reasons why I like to change the way that webinars are done, because I've sat in so many webinars since this thing started that I wanted to make it more interactive. And the last but not least there, I would say the shift in customer patterns, you know. So the journeys that these that, that our customers are on, they want now to be able to see and decide for themselves up front. And prior to this, uh, this COVID area, you could convince them in other ways. You could do it by via ads, whatever it might be. But now it's going to be all pretty much right here on this, this little electronic gadget that we call a computer or, or on the Internet. Yeah. So. We, we've got to have a really clear end-to-end -end perspective of our business and not just a model for the, the site or, or a model for the, the product uh, value stream. Yeah, we've got, we got to really look at the whole value chain. So how many of you are facing some of these same challenges? And I, and I hope that most of us, we can just raise our hand and go, yep, yeah, that's good. Um, but I wanted to demonstrate to you how this, this session is sort of organized. I'm going to be sharing anywhere from six to 10 slides, and then you're going to see one of these. So the very first one, I usually get very few questions because everybody's like, all right, we're getting into it. No problem. But the next section, I would hope that I would see some hands that are raised and uh, that you ask uh, your, your own situation, your own challenges that, that you happen to be in, and I can share some insights to that. So with that, I'll just move forward for this particular Q&A session. So the three big ideas, that's what we're really talking about today. I think it's important that we need to know that most people that are gone out there and tried to implement lean have actually failed. So we're talking, you know, 79% of those people that are out there that have tried have actually failed at getting the results that they initially attended to, to achieve. And I have to tell you, one of the main reasons for that is, is leadership, the lack of leadership engagement. If it doesn't come from the top, and you don't have a clear roadmap, this causes failure. A lot of people try to do the project-based, uh, you know, or a lot of people try to do the bottom-up, let's get ideas and let's change everything. It just doesn't sustain without a, a, strate a strategical kind of perspective. Second thing is, and I'm big on this because digital is something that I offer as, as a solution. Um, just recently, we found out that 70% of them fail as well. So a, a high percentage fail because usually it has to do with, it's not the technical savvy aspect of it. It's really technically elo eloquent. It's usually that they don't get the buy-in from people when they're trying to deploy it. And it's an emotional uh, attribute. And I'll talk about that here in a moment. And then last but not least, you know, you can say SAP systems, ERP systems. Uh, they, they themselves have been taking longer to complete and are also not as, as successful. Even though these solutions are out there, this is, the, this is the challenge that organizations are facing. It's not just putting things from digital into automation and from automation into digitalizing your models. It's, it's truly about getting people involved. And so the common aspect here is that, is that attitude, if you may, or that emotional acceptance kind of uh, 
criteria. And you can see here that the equation, many organizations have a high score in the in the qualitative or the quantitative aspect of of deploying some sort of change, but they miss the actual, you know, acceptance score uh, by a high degree because they think that, you know, this person who came up with this great idea and deploys it, it's going to work. Uh, you, you'd be surprised how many RPAs, robotics that have been implemented that just cost millions of dollars to put into place. And everybody says, well, we still can do that better with people. And that's, that's the truth. It's how it works. And Toyota has recognized that early on in their, their time with what would they call uh, autonomation or Jadoka. Yeah. So what are the three big ideas? Well, they're simple. Um, first, you know, put standard work into place. Now, we have a systematic seven step process that we do this on, and it allows you to put all the, you know, the standard work combination sheets, all these type of things. I'm not getting into that today. What I'm getting into is why standard work. And, and the old cliche that Taichi Ono used to say, without a standard, there can be no improvement. It's truly, truly uh, the, 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 the cusp of reason why we believe this is, this is the key to implementing the three big ideas. The second is no matter what you put into place, you need to make it visual because we are a visual world today. In fact, this gets about 87% of the information, our eyes. And as babies, you know, that's all we did. We saw things, we looked at it, we picked it up as a pencil, we broke it. Oh, can I get another one? That was cool. But the reality is it was visual to us. We got, we got to see it. And that's, that's important when we're communicating. And then the third is to link that to the spirit and intention of Kaizen. And I will talk deeply about this because there are so many different levels of Kaizen that we need to engage with. And of course, here at uh, Makoto Flow, we profess 12 leadership paradigms. Uh, we call them, you know, the behaviors that we want to see from the actions that, that, that we are imparting. So the three big ideas in the simplest form is standard work, visual management, and Kaizen. Okay. Now, why standard work, we say, is because over time, what happens with most organizations is that they, they go out and they implement some sort of change in the organization, and it goes right up, and then goes right back down. So, meaning that in, in the first 30 days, everything's looking great. In 60 days, it's, it's starting to slide back down. In 90 days, it's back to where it used to be. So, what standard work does is it allows you to make the improvement and then decide exactly where you, sh you want to be able to slide back to. And that helps keep the standard in place over that period of time that you made the improvement. So when I go and do an engagement, and let's say it's, it happens to be in a, um, a facility that is, is providing food. So it could be a restaurant, it could be a dining facility for a corporation. And you know they're trying to eliminate uh, food waste we actually put in, into place mechanisms, jigs, fixtures to measure all of the products that they're actually cooking and putting on people's plates so that we know that at a standard of the quality and the level of food and also the waste is being minimized and, and, and being standardized, yeah, as a great example. Now, there's a lot of ways to see standardization. For us in many businesses that have varying demands, all we focus is on our first understanding about the three components to standard work. And that is, it has to be a repeatable activity. And even if that repeatable activity is only occurring once a, once a year, like the Formula One race in Singapore at night, it only happens once a year. You can put standards around that event in order to make sure that the following year's event goes a lot smoother. A second is that it has to have reliability. And me meaning that because it's repeating, it's always creating the same level of consistency in the way they do things. And I'm sure everybody that's here has done some barbecuing at some time, especially in Georgia, right? Um, or you've actually, you know, did some cooking. And if you don't follow a certain kind of standard or recipe, then each time what you cook sort of tastes a little bit different. And so that's the reliability piece. And then of course you need this capability. You need the knowledge, the know-how uh, to be able to make all those things uh, happen. And so I'd like to demonstrate this from some my years of being in the in the military. And uh, as I travel the world from, you know, 1983 to, to 1994, 
we always had to, to sort of, you know, get clocked into being able to shoot different kinds of weaponry. And we were always taught this thing called brass, which means breathe, relax, aim, squeeze, shoot. Yeah. And so when you're qualifying, I'm going to show this as an example. And somebody's looking down range and they say, oh, that's a little high. You have a tendency then to adjust. And so, oh, you're too low. And then they say, oh, okay, too low. Oh, bam, nice shot. Keep it right there. And you're like, well, I don't know what I did right there. So now you're to the right, now you're to the left, and so on. Yeah. So it's very hard then. Oh, that's not mine. Somebody shot on that. But uh, you don't have the consistency here of time. And if I go back to my Deming days, you know, when you think of statistical process control, you need to have a certain number of uh, uh, of data points in order to really agree with what is occurring on that point. And so I tell the, the, the spotter, don't tell me what's happening. Just tell me brass, breathe, relax, aim, squeeze, shoot. And so I do that and I'm consistently, hold on a minute. There we go. I'm consistently putting those rounds down to down range on target. And it's because I wasn't being asked to move. But these seven data points allow me then to focus not just on the outcomes as the previous one, but the results. And then I can adjust because we have what is called windage and elevation. And we call that side alignment, side picture. And that allows you then for the next time you go around to put more of those closer to the bullseye. And that's truly what TPS does. It allows you to do a systematic process a certain way. And then through that process, you standardize it. And from that standardization, you visualize it. And then you're able to improve it through Kaizen to get to the point that you really want to get to. And, and I don't know about you, but I'd rather be shooter B than shooter A in that scenario. Here's some, some standards that we've generated over the years with different clients. And like I said, standards come in many different forms, many different uh, styles. But here's one of, of a supply cabinet where you can see there's a little red combine card in there. And that tells you what to order when. And so once once that, that card falls down or, or, sh or shows up, you put it in the box and the next day it's ordered. Uh, here's another one that has to do with location. So the binders are organized around, let's say, time or frequency of time. You don't have to read the dates and the, and the look where it's from, you can just look at the, the line and place it right back where, where you got it from. It's very quick and easy, right? So it's a standard, but it's actually been made visual. And we can make this even better. Here's some other standards with flow and volume. So you got the, the flow photos, so you know exactly how much is in it and how, how, uh, how much pressure is in those, those pipes and what, what direction it's flowing from. And of course, here's some with some other liquids and hydraulics and pneumatics. And, and these allow you to know what's happening when. And in Japan, wherever you go, and there has to be something to do with gas, this is just like a standard. It's, you know, this is the on-off switch, but it's different colors. So, you know, green is good and red is bad. It's not just saying flow that way and off that way, on that way. And so we really have to, to do the right stuff. Here's some things that we did in Europe um, with shadow boards. Uh, the standards for the tool sets, they're on rails. You can just move them back and forth, left and right, forward and back. And it allows you to, 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 to have, a, have a toolbox, if you may, of, um, of a lot of uh, uh, pieces of, uh, of tools to be able to quickly visualize what is it that you need and then return it. Okay? And then, of course, on the right-hand side here, here's the cost of each item. So we actually went into one of the Japanese companies and we saw this and we were like, this is fantastic. So why did you show this? And it was a, a means of showing people that just don't throw your stuff away. If it's still useful, keep using it because it costs this much money. And over time, this is the total volume that we actually expense. Yeah. And here, when we were working in Spain and, and Portugal, uh, we, we put together what is called one point lessons on how to actually do something. And this one was filling the, the, the donuts up. Uh, then there was one here of, how do you actually clean the, the process? And then one, how do you actually clean your hands uh, prior to, to uh, baking? Yeah. So let me ask you a question. What kind of standards do you have 
in place? And, and what, what kind of questions do you have about standards for me? And I, again, we put them in, we put them in, in practice so that we know basically where we're at and what we need to do to complete the activities that we're in charge with today. So let's take a few questions here. Please uh, go down to the bottom right-hand corner, click on that little reactions button and, and raise your hand and, and we'll take a question or two. This is your opportunity to talk about standards. And if nobody raises their hand, I have a, I have a question for all of you. Uh, so Nozomi raised her hand, so we'll go right there. Go Nozomi. Yeah, um, you know, I work with a lot of companies too. And um, so curious to, to hear your thoughts around um, what gets in the way for companies to, to, have, to have a really good standard of work. Um, I think the first one is a perception. And by the way, that's a great question, Nozomi, because, you know, people always think that standards limit my creativity. Um, and I like to share a story of a colleague of mine. Her name was Jackie Allen, one of the most energetic and, you know, confident individuals you ever met. But she was always all over the place. I used to call her splatter. You know, she would help over here and not finish anything. She would help over here and not finish anything. Right. So we put some standards in place. And next thing you know, her capability went through the roof. So the first thing I think that gets in the way is this perception that standards limit my creativity. That's, that's the first thing. And it doesn't. Because the whole point of a standard is it's focusing you now on doing something the right way at that moment, but you can always make it better. You can change it. And that's the beauty of the standard. Yeah. And I think the second thing is, is that standards are usually in a binder. They're usually in what was called the ISO office or, you know, somebody is controlling the standards and it has to be globally done this way. Standards aren't meant that way. And in a Toyota, they have standards for every kind of activity that there is, but it does, that doesn't transition from the, from the Motomachi plant to the Asashimachi Asa, plant. And it doesn't, doesn't transfer because what they want is that plant to be standardized the way they best practice and this plant for themselves. So I would say those are the two, two major uh, inhibitors to- Yeah, to I love that. Um, one thing I, I say often is, to your point for the number one, is that um, standards just let our, our systems create, create ideal behavior, and yeah. that will allow to um, for the employees or for the you know for the company to create more capacity. Like you said, the more creativity because they're not thinking, they're focused. And um, so I think that's one thing into your point. Um, Absolutely. Yeah, a lot of people, and I think especially what I find in certain companies that um, value creativity, um, to your point, have that misunderstanding that we're kind of micromanaging or limiting, and they don't really understand the fundamental of actually it creates more capacity to do more of what they actually want to do. But yeah, thank you so much for the wonderful answers. You no, know, I think that was spot on. You know, I, I went to uh, uh, Dallas, uh, right there in Denton, Texas, I should say, right, right outside of Dallas. And I was working with a, co a company called Packard or Peterbilt, Peterbilt Trucks. And they had, they had these gentlemen that were, you know, pretty elderly, probably 50 to, to 60 years old. And they were like, these folks, they just don't, they're not going to do TPS. So let's not get them engaged. I was like, no, no, these, these are the guys we need to engage. They have the knowledge. They have the know-how. So we need to get them engaged. So I went down and I talked to two or three of them and they, all of them were afraid of sharing the knowledge because they would lose their job. That's, that's truly how they thought. And I said, that's not the point. We, we, we have this thing called the gray foxes. You're a gray fox. And let me describe what a gray fox is. They take standards from the past, educate the newest people that are coming in to make that standard even better. And, and uh, all of them were like, oh, you mean, you mean they're going to listen to the ideas on how to make it better? Said, yeah. And as soon as they did, they were on board like it was cool. So don't, don't worry about people because people try to do good. There's 99% good out there. Only 1% has a jerk factor in it. Yeah. So any other questions? Well, I, I said I have one question for all of you. So I know not everybody's on the screen, but thank you for those that have come on with a video. Do you have standards at home? And I, I will tell you right now, 
without a doubt, doubt, you have a standard at home. You could close your eyes right now and act like you're opening up your refrigerator and reach for that drink. And you know exactly where it's at because you always put it there or those eggs. Or when you come home and you drop off your car keys somewhere, that's a standard. You put it in a certain place so you don't lose it, right? So those are the basic standards in life. They exist. When you drive, you have standards, right? You, you know exactly. You're looking at speed limits. You're looking at how fast you're going. You're wearing seat belts. These are all things that have become standard in our society. And, and they're there because they make us more capable. Yeah. And they change the way our behavior is. Um, and seat belts, for example, were put in there because of the high speeds. Yeah. So anyways. Oh, somebody else has a hand up. Alexandria. Hi. Uh, Hello. Yep, I, I can hear you. We can't see you, but that's go. That's okay. Please. Uh, so I work in a, a the pharmaceutical industry, and oh um, yeah, we're, we're pretty big on uh, using lean tools. But one thing we've run into is we have standards SOPs for how mm -hmm. we do things, but then we also want to implement standard work for the most efficient way to do something within within the confines of the SOP yeah. uh, requirements. And I was wondering if you've ever run into that in your line of work and how to kind of reconcile those kind of things. Yeah. Uh, well, well, let me, let me just share a small scenario that I, that I, that I experienced probably 98% of the time I go into an organization and, and they say, DJ, what do you do? And I said, in the simplest way, this is what I do. I go into a company and I create structure with the right sequence for the right layout. That's basically what I do, okay? And that creates optimization. And then they say, oh, standard work. I was like, yeah. And they go, well, we got that. I said, well, show it to me. So then they, they go to some file cabinet and pull out this, this folder and go, here's our standard work. My next question is, so that's the way you do work? Oh no, that's our standard work. Um, so they do it because it's a paper drill. and in the pharmaceutical industry, because of transparency, it's very important to have that kind of paperwork in place. But that's not necessarily what standard work is all about. Standard work is actually designed to say, this is the worst way you can do it today, change it. And that's what people in certain industries don't quite get. So what I challenge them with is bring out the SOPs, okay, the standard operating procedures, Focusing on making a one page uh, type of standard work that everybody can see the sequence, the layout and how the system actually works. And then challenge yourself to change something in it. And that gets people to think, well, I've, I've been saying we need to change this and yeah, well, let's do that now. Let's, let's give it a shot. Because once you get them engaged in their ideas, that's when it, it sort of just, it just expands, right? It's, it's like a muscle. You know, it's, it's small at the beginning and so you keep working, it's it bigger and bigger and bigger. And it's the same way with, with that ability to Kaizen, to improve, is you have to look at it and, and make, it, make it change. So um, I, I would challenge the norm and then I would go out and make small improvements to prove the value of those, uh, those improvements to other people. So that's, that's what I would do. And unfortunately, you're in an industry that's, that doesn't like to change too much, right? And when they do change, they want the big shiny technology, right? Yes. <laughs> so <laughs> I, I get it. I get it. Uh, one thing you can change without actually going to the SOPs is the way you communicate. And we, I'll talk a little bit about that today. So, so listen into that. Okay. All right. I'm going to go ahead and move forward. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen again. Thank you for those questions. Boom. And going to the next piece. So the next piece is visual management. And um, so th there's, a, there's a lot of, there's one lady out there that I, that I admire. Her name is Gwendolyn Glassford. And she's up there in the Rhode Island area. And she has this thing about visual thinking and how visual management is actually about changing people's way to think. It's not about actually saying, this is good or this is bad. It's actually going beyond that. And so let's take, I want to take a little look into how we actually communicate uh, per that last question, I believe from Alexandria. Um, 
So when we can communicate, what we're trying to do with the power of visual management is to see when things are going well and when they're not going well and instantly make a decision based on that. And so we use visual devices to influence our behaviors. How many of you ever seen those uh, those signs before you go underneath a bridge as you're driving? It says, you know, six foot eight, you know, <laughs> eight inches. And you're thinking, OK, is my car going to fit underneath there? You know, it, it's about changing your behavior about something in, ahead of you. And that's what visual devices really help us do. And so we need to be able to get people to understand and recognize what those visual uh, devices are telling us so that we can know what is right, what's wrong, what resources we need, um, where the material is, when to replenish it, you know, those type of things to allow us to be more efficient and effective. Now, I'm a, I'm a proponent of visual management because I did my own study uh, basically over the last, you know, 12 years with leaders and where they spend a lot of their time. And what I found out is they spend a lot of their time searching. It's about 38% of the time searching for information. And it's because it's not visual for them. They can't find it quickly. I mean, think about your, your email in your inbox and how difficult it is for you to find somebody's thing if you don't type their name in and say, hey, where's Nozomi's email, right? And Nozomi pops up. But if you didn't put it in the right place, it's hard to actually find very quickly. So we, we, we want to make sure that the power of visual management is truly recognized and harnessed in many different ways. And as I was saying before, you know, the eyes truly uh, are the door or the window to our knowledge and the, what we can do. Yes, there are systems out there that you need to listen to. There are systems out there you need to smell. I even seen people touch and taste. You know, I happen to be working with Nippon uh, um, uh, paper. So it's a basically a magazine kind of organization with pulp wood turning it into paper. And the guy would walk up to the machine and literally put his uh, a bar onto the machine because you could not see inside the equipment and listen. And through the bar vibration, he would know whether or not the uh, the 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 bearings were, were were running well and whether they had to do repairs or not. So, I mean, it's all about collecting information. But then once you collect the information, what do you actually retain? And then how can you actually maximize it? And you can see here that if you just listen to me today, probably 10 percent of what I say is what you're going to retain. The rest of it's going to go whoop whoop right out. Right. So engaging people and, and making them read and then engaging people and, and helping them share with others is truly what elevates the learning capability and then uh, the retention as well. And so, so that's another reason why we, we put in place very strong visual management kind of practices. And remember I was telling you about Dr. Gwendolyn Glassford. Well, here's her four levels of visual devices when you're trying to really engage people and changing their behaviors. You know, most of us, we just do some, some, some visual indicators like arrows going left or right or black and yellow colored things to, you know, watch out for or red for danger, you know, and, and that's, that's limited, but it really has no power in changing your behavior except for potentially preventing an incident. We got to go beyond that. We, we've got to be able to come up with some visual signals. And that's when you have the and on. You know, the Andon has the three or four lights, depending on what's out there. But, but Andon in itself is truly just a means to signal you. And so in many organizations, it's not even lights, it's sounds. It, when you hear the music, you know it's break time, for example. Those are visual signals that you are now incorporating through your auditorial system. And then, of course, you have visual controls. And many organizations get to that when there's high, when there's lots of equipment. Uh, within the facility, but if there's not, and you happen to be more in a service kind of side of the house, or or like I call it the heart of the house, it's very limited in the visual controls with regards to the the what is right and what's not right. Uh, now within our systems, our computers, there are you know the noises beep beep can't do that beep beep for wrong data entry so forth that occurs, but we need things to be a lot more visually controlled because that truly gives us a lot of power. And then last but not least, it's the guarantee, the visual guarantee. Your ability to say, this is all good. We can keep moving forward. And I would just like to say that you get that when you go pump your gas, you know. Uh, the visual guarantee is it stops, click, 
And then if you keep going, it overflows, right? So th there are now mechanisms in place where it goes, doo, 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 and if you try to click it more than twice, it stops. You can't click anymore. So that's a guarantee that you will visually understand your full, yeah, as an example. And we need to really put that in place in the way we do uh, visual management within our environments. Now, now, when we talk about visual management, we're really talking about three basic rules, right? Um, we're, we're talking about making things within our business, within our practices, uh, easy to understand. Also, that it's easily visible. It's big. It's easy to uh, decide. And, of course, it helps you to, to be more interactive and to change things. I want you to think about going into a fast food restaurant right now and you walk into McDonald's or Burger King and you can see huge visuals, right? What's up there, what the prices are and so on. And in many of these uh, uh, institutions now it's electronic. So you walk up to a board and it's, it's your touch, it's your hand, <clears throat> you're making all the decisions. That is what we say are, are applying the three rules of Miruka. Right? And, and, and Miruka is really about creating understanding of the environments that you're at. And so I worked with an insurance company in, in Holland and a lot of the people in the call center did things differently left and right because of the standard. And, and once they made it visualized, the standard, there was no variance to it. So there was, a, there was a sense of unity. There was a sense of we're all working together in the same way. You improved the, your efficiency. You improved your, 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 your capabilities to solving the issues on those, in those call centers. So there's really, truly a lot of great benefit to visual management. Yeah. And here are some that I love to share. Uh, this one here is from the subway. I used to always ride the, the purple one there. It's called the Hanzamon line up in Tokyo. It's where my office used to be. And then, of course, this one here where it says two minutes to the next toilet is down in Singapore. So, you know, when you're walking, you're like, nah, I don't got to go to the bathroom right now. You know, you know, two minutes later, there'll be another toilet down the way, you know. Um, and then, of course, one of the organizations I work with, Philips there, this is a visual flow map of how they make actually bulbs. So visual management is, is a powerful thing. So some basic rules that I think everybody needs to really adhere to when we talk visual management is that it's not to make the office pretty. It's not to say DJ works here. Here's his uh, sign, his arrow pointing that way. You know, he's the audit guy, whatever it might be. Yeah? It's not about that. It's truly about managing everyone to make things better every day. Yeah. And if you can't make it every day, try to make it every week. And if you can't make it every week, try to make it once a month. Yeah. Um, it's also about changing your behavior, the way you engage, the reason why you engage. I mean, we already know that visual management works because, you know, we have stoplights, red, you know, yellow. And in, in Japan, they call it green, blue, right? <laughs> so, but it is green. Uh, the whole point is it changes your behavior. You know that red means stop. You know that yellow means caution or, hey, hit the pedal go through it, you know, uh, and then green means all's good. Yeah. And, and then the last thing I think when we really think about visual management is that if it's, if it's too old, it doesn't change anything. So then I say, take it down. So when I have, when I build communication cells with people and you might know them as huddle boards uh, that McKinsey has made famous, I don't do it around the SDQC model. I usually do it around people performance and continuous improvement because that's what Toyota does. They want to know where their people are at today, both emotionally as well as capability wise. Are they safe and so on? And then we, we create two or three key performance metrics for that team. And that allows them to do things better. And then we like to know where they're making improvements. Yeah. And why they're making those improvements. And so uh, it's really about empowering people. And if the information's old, it doesn't empower them. They just see it every day and they just go right by it. It doesn't mean anything. So it's got to change on a daily basis or a maximum, a weekly basis, in order to really impact people's behavior. And don't overcomplicate it. Engineers like to overcomplicate things. Simplify it. Make sure it's really easy to understand and straightforward. I'll give you a great example. Um, if I go and I see some of these, these huddle boards out there, they have pie charts, they have bar charts, they have run charts. They should all be one chart. And all those charts should be whatever you decide, have at least what the goal is on it, and then where you're at at attaining that goal, plain and simple. So if you start with a bar chart, all of them should be bar charts. So it makes it very easy for people to understand right off the bat. 
here's a, a great visual management tool that we talk about, those, those uh, communication cells. It's simple, it's relevant, and it tells a story. And I'll just give you some examples of it. You know, you got the people one, you got the performance one, and you got the continuous improvement one. And of course, Unipart was one of my customers. And this one over here is a Chinese one, right? So I was working in Philips in China. And, you know, it's always about getting people to understand what that standard is. So you gotta, you gotta spend some time educating them, creating that energy around. It. And then once you've educated them, then everything needs to be made visible at the end. It doesn't matter what the line is, how well they're performing, or how bad they're performing. You just gotta, you gotta make it happen. And now Japan is no different than any other country. There's only about five to 8% of the, uh, the companies in Japan that are really good at TPS. You know, most of them are, are still on their journey. They're struggling to understand and, and incorporate a lot of these things. Uh, but they, they are definitely going through the teaching, the visualization, and then the sharing of what was changed and, and why it was changed, yeah. So let's get some questions on visual management. What are some of your challenges with visual management and um, uh, wh where do you think you need to take your visual management opportunities to the next level? You know, are you at level one? Are you trying to get to level two? What were you at? Let's take a few questions. So DJ, just real quick from, from me. Um, yeah. So I think more so in the US and maybe other countries than in Japan, um, you know, when there are multiple languages being spoken on the floor in a company, what happens yep. with, uh, I guess, the, the visuals? Do you incorporate more pictures and images rather than words or um, how have you seen, I guess, the most successful visual management systems in place? Yeah, you know, it's a, it's really funny that you asked that question, Yoshi, but it's it's actually a really good question, too, because we visit one of the suppliers of Toyota, and it's it's, it's one of their big suppliers. Uh, it's called Show Logistics. And Show Logistics uh, is probably about nine minutes away from the Motomachi plant. But in that logistics site, there are three uh, types of, uh, I should say, three cultures. Yeah. So you got the Japanese culture, and then you have a lot of Brazilians that are there, and then you have now some Chinese. So everything that they've done is prior to the, to the Chinese and the Brazilians coming in, it was all in Japanese, it was very visual, lots of pictures. But now what they've done is they've incorporated that same thing with big words in uh, Portuguese and, 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 and Spanish, if you may, as well as in uh, Chinese. So they're, they're making it so that everybody understands what that's truly saying in one glance, whatever country you're coming from. Um, but when you, if, you, if, you, if you can't make it all into the different languages, it's best to use pictorials because th that's where we get the, the insights, yeah? So what is good? And green is good, smiley face, easy, right? Red is bad, frowny face, easy to understand. So even though the chart might be in Japanese, they're actually putting on that, that visual indicator to say whether it was good or bad. They're actually attributing that with a magnet. So yeah, definitely very important to do. And as I travel around the globe and I'm working in places like Dubai, you know, you have 10% are Emirati. The rest are from other parts of the world, Philippines, uh, you know, uh, 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 Nepal, you name it, all sorts of different countries. So everything has to be visualized and it has to be something that's easily grasped. So yeah, great, great question. I hope I answered. Any other questions? We had a question come through the chat box. Um, if it's okay. all right, get over to you. Um, uh, so this person agrees with your opinion, the importance of visualization, obviously, but uh, they usually face a difficulty to decide which figures or info information uh, they should select and visualize. Uh, because there are so many numbers of kinds of statistics and information uh, in real business, uh, and each of them are very important. The question is, how should you choose and what should you pay attention to to find the key for, you know, what, what do you, I guess, prioritize more, more so in your visualizations? Well, you know, I, whoever asked that question and put it in the chat box, I appreciate it. I didn't go look. But here, here's the one thing that I try to tell everyone. What you visualize is what matters most. That's what you visualize. So you have to decide for this team, for this department, for this area, what is what matters most here? And so we don't want to visualize, you know, 10 or 15 things because then it takes away the importance of each one of them. You know, it's it's minimized. 
So I like to tell people that when you try to visualize something on your huddle board or your communication cell, it should be one to three things, you know, one to three things, never any more. If you go more, you're trying to bring those three things together in one collective perspective. So it's, it's almost like you're cascading these metrics into one metric, yeah? Um, the attribution of it. So I like to always share that at the shop floor, ask your people, what's important to you? Now, you know, as the team leader, what's important to your boss, who you report to. So all you're trying to do is get what, what's important to them to attribute it to the same metric that you have, that you know it needs to go up. And that's what I like to, to get people to do. I'll, I'll give you a good example. I'm working with, uh, back in the day, a couple of years ago, I worked with Sands China, big casino, five different properties, you know, 25,000 rooms, um, you know, casinos and all of the, the hotels. They were measuring how many hours the employee was actually dealing cards. And when we asked the employees and we said, what would you like to measure? Believe it or not, they came back and said, how much money I took in during the time that I spent there, right? Well, you know, when I asked the, the pit manager who's, who's in charge of maybe 10 or 15 different tables, and I said, what are you being measured on right now? Oh, how, how long the tables are being kept open. I was like, oh, okay, great, great. What do you think you should be measured on? And he said, how much money we're making in this pit? You know, so people actually know what to measure. You just got to take the time to ask them and then connect it to what, what else is being measured as well. Yeah. And at each level, it's different. Okay. So when I'm at the executive level uh, and I'm talking uh, TPS and, and the transformation that we're doing, I'm not talking about space utilization. I saved 20% space. I'm, I'm only talking about three key things, either a cost savings, a cost avoidance, or revenue generation. That's it at that level. But as I go down one, it's more about shared resources. It's about how well I'm using my resources. So I really want to engage people in measuring what matters in the way they're interacting with their teams and their departments. Yeah. And then, of course, when you go down to the shop floor, it's all about how well they perform. So if I'm at a front desk again at, the, at, at SANS, I want to know how comfortable this person is doing their job, how many people they've checked in. Sure, I want to know those things, but at the same token, I also want to know how well my, my front desk is processing the amount of time. So when I check in, if I take seven minutes to check in, I'm angry. So I need to get it down to maybe one minute. And that's that's truly what makes everybody happier because it's easier, simpler, safer. You know, So that, that, that's what I would say to you. Ask your people find out what they would like to be measured, and then attribute it to the higher uh, need, the higher goal. Cool. All right, I guess I will continue on then to the, to the next phase here. And now we're gonna talk about Kaizen, right? So we talked about standard work out of the three big ideas, and without it, you can't really improve. So you gotta create that, create that stability within your organization. Then visualize that standard in such a way that people are inspired to do things and get excited about it, and they can do it faster, easier, and safer. Uh, but then once we get done with that, how do we make it even better all the time? And so many of you know about Kaizen. I mean, you've seen this probably, this slide a thousand times, uh, but there's so much more to Kaizen than what people really uh, understand. So first of all, this, what you see right now is I attribute to Masaki Mai because this is from his book, Gemba Kaizen, yeah, and how Kaizen is truly translated. But when I talked to my sensei, Miyuda-san, that was really funny is how when he was in the States with his sensei and they were going through a, a factory, there's actually no word that best suits Kaizen except for continuous improvement. So it got translated into continuous improvement when actually it has a different meaning, yeah? So let me just sort of describe a little bit about the deeper meaning of the actual kanji characters of Kaizen. And so Kai and Zen, obviously very, very uh, uh, formalized way of saying it, but the, the kanji in itself has meaning. So the first part of that kanji is about yourself. It's about who you are. So when we talk about Kai, we're actually talking about, hey, DJ, look at yourself. And then I want you to push yourself, or in this case, 
whip yourself like you have a whip in your hand and you're going across your back like this, whip yourself to do better. That's what the sort of the essence is. So it's really self engagement. Okay. And then the second part, that Zen piece, you know, we always think about Zen as being om and harmony. It is about that. But at the same token, that Zen is actually broken down in such a way that talks about the words you use, the speech that you use, the energy that you use is important in driving Kaizen. You can't just go, okay, today we are about to do a Kaizen and we are going to change this cart. It, it, people aren't excited about that. You got to have energy behind it. And, and you'll notice that the, the top half of this particular kanji character also talks about a sacrificial lamp. And we're not talking like, you know, so, some, some, some people do, you know, with chickens and stuff like that. We're actually talking about yourself sacrificing yourself by whipping yourself to help others with the right words and the, and, and the, and the right influences to make change happen. And, and, it's, and it's a righteous thing to do. It's the right thing to do. Yep. Uh, for me, in, in Kaizen, I've actually formulated my own version of how it looks. And so I took the, the meaning of what is called mizu or water or soy in Chinese and said, this is important for everybody to understand. When you Kaizen, you need to know that it's like water. It should flow naturally. If you do it where it's unnatural, you are going to cause a problem. Just like a beaver makes a dam, it causes the, fl the water to stop flowing. And eventually the dam breaks and then there's a flood. So we need to make sure that it goes through the simplest, easiest way form of resistance. And so Kaizen is about, about, about water. And you need water uh, as a person to survive. So Kaizen is about the business and its ability to survive by constantly improving. The second thing is the AI, I. So I steru really means I love you, right? But I itself also means passion, purpose. And so you want to make sure that you're finding people that are passionate about doing it. You know, over at McDonald's, they say, hey, I'm loving it here in Japan. They say, oh, I'm loving it. You know, that, and, and McDonald's is, is very famous in Japan. But at the same token, it, it's the energy behind it that people want to then go and see it. And then the last piece there, you can see it says Zen. We look at Zen as synchronization. And in Japan, there's a, there's a huge... Um, uh, cultural thing called the Yamato. And the Yamato means harmony. So we want to make sure that our systems, whatever we have together, are in harmony with one another. So that if you improve this system, it doesn't hurt this system. It's about synchronizing it so it works well. And the only way that can happen is through this, through your mind and through people's knowledge and capability with their hands to make things better. So Kaizen is not about putting things into computers to make it, uh, you know, this uh, tech savvy. It's actually about making things more effective for people in the way they do things. So there's another form of, of Kaizen and we call it Kaikaku. And so you have what is called spot Kaizen and I'll show you that in a graph here in just a moment. And then you have uh, team spot Kaizen and then you got this thing called Kaikaku. And it's about radical change. And usually this is around your layouts or your value streams and you're totally changing the way things are happening. But, you, but you're making it unique for that very particular product family that's going through there. And so it's truly about, instead of making small improvements through Kaizen over time, you're making one big improvement like with a sledgehammer, yeah? And then of course, you have Jishukin. Now Jishukin is like the Thor hammer, right? It's, a, it's where you get all management involved. And this is about getting them to understand the value of actually changing the, 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 the whole factory uh, or, or the, the supply chain in supporting the factory. It's truly a major, major undergoing of getting the mindset of the management team to understand the power of Kaikaku, Kaizen, Team Kaizen, and Individual Kaizen, and, uh, and then deploying that through one major you know, deployment. Now, Jishukens are usually goal-driven, so it's strategy-driven, where Kaikaku isn't. It's, it's, it's sort of made out of demand or the need. And Kaizen is usually made out of the personal engagement, the process engagement. Yeah. And this is how I like to demonstrate it, share it with people. Um, and you'll notice that when you look down at the bottom there, the colors of blue, is, these are usually the easy, quick things to do. I, I like to say that Kaizen you can do by yourself, but at the same token, it's always better to do with people because ideas 
generate from one idea to second idea, then to that third alternative, you know, that synergy. And you can do it around basic things like 3S and ergonomics and safety, right? Whereas once you get into where you're doing more Kaizen events or blitzes, as some people might call it, this is where you're actually solving problems from a process and a value stream perspective. And you're really having some small uh, quality, you know, cost delivery kind of outcomes based on time. And then when you go up into the, to the project Kaizens or the Kai Kaku, as well as the Jishikins, this is truly where you're getting massive returns for the organization that hit the EBITDA, the bottom line P&Ls, uh, where you really see some end-to-end -end improvements in, in the way you do the, the, the engagement. So what's some of your questions now on Kaizen or Kai Kaku or, or Jishuken? Who wants to ask any questions on that one? Stop sharing for a moment. How many of you have actually seen a slide like I just demonstrated before? Because, you know, most companies I, I talk to, they're like, hmm, uh, we've never done a Kaikaku, you know, but we have done projects. It's the same thing, right? Um, we've never done Jishikin. You've never had management lead a, an improvement initiative for an entire year of the business. You do that. You just do it differently. And so, you know, Toyota really designs these engagements to change the behaviors of people and the way they think about why they're in those, those, those positions. You know, a lot of people that are in, for example, um, Tracy Richardson and Eric Rich, uh, Ernie Richardson that came out of um, uh, Team MC, uh, Team MK out of Kentucky, they, they keep talking about Cho and how Cho used to always say, I'm here to help you. And this is the, this is the chairman of Toyota, you know, I'm here to help you. What can I help you with? Well, what do you need? And, th and that's sort of the spirit of one, once you get involved with Jishukens, you understand that that's your number one role is to help others. Yeah. So any questions on Kaizen or Kai Kaku or, or Jishuken? What are some tips for sustaining Kaizen? Um, well, I, I think it's in the three big ideas. First, uh, you know, whatever Kaizen you do, I think it's important that you, that you standardize the outcome of it, okay? Now, I... I, I from my perspective, and I'm not a, ze a zealot, and I'm not a purist, but I've seen people do things like value stream mapping. And then on the value stream map, they would put what's called a Kaizen burst. And in that Kaizen burst, they'll write things like standard work. So we're going to put standard work in place. Everything you do needs standard work. Everything you do needs visual management. Everything you need that you do needs to be improved. Kaizen. So... It's not about doing that that way. It should be a system. I'm going to put a FIFO system in place. And when you put that FIFO system in place, which is first in, first out, that's when you put in place the actual rules for that FIFO system so that it doesn't break, so that it can, it, FIFO is a controlled flow mechanism. So it allows people to do things. Uh, when somebody uh, goes and does, let's say, a, a change at their desk or a change in a process that they're doing on a computer, with regards to, let's say, procurement and, and finding people, and you make those changes. You need to document that and be able to share it through what is called an OPL, one-point lesson, with others. That's the sustainability of it. And when you only make the changes, but don't do the standard work, the visualization, and then the next improvement, um, then you, you're not going to sustain that change. It will fall back down. That's what I tried to illustrate with the wheel going up and then the wheel going back down. Yeah. So many companies hire consultants to come in and do Kaizen events. And even if it's some of the biggest brands in the world, they come in, they make some great changes. And, you know, two, three months later, it's back to where it used to be because they didn't take the time to put that into place. And that's very important to do. Um, it's not just about changing for change sake. Any of you that are out there, if you really want to, to know the power of winning with with um, this type of thinking, you should really look at the 10 precepts of Taichi Ono. And in it, it, it clearly states exactly what you need to do. And, and if you follow those 10 precepts, you will be sustaining that kind of activity, yeah? Because it says, you gotta keep changing. It says, you're a cost, so make things easier, yeah? It says those type of words that allows you to do that. 
Hope I answered your question. But definitely it's standard work visual management type. Yeah. Anything else? Uh, here's one here from Austin. It says, has Toyota thought about using surveys or reviews to what they can do to make processes more efficient? Uh, yes, uh, to Toyota does that all the time. Toyota internally does, you know, your, your typical em employee engagement uh, surveys, but they also are constantly having meetings on a, on a monthly basis with their teams. They're constantly having daily meetings with their teams. And this is a review, a survey of what needs to change because they're always asking what's difficult, what's tedious, and what are some of your ideas to make things better, yeah? And out of that comes, you know, millions of ideas. And they don't quantify it with ROI. That's another thing. So Toyota doesn't go out there and say, listen, we did 100 um, changes, Kaizen's, and this is the return on investment. They don't do that. They, they throw money at it because they know it's six to 10 times more valuable than what they can, they can get on their own. So it, it's a spirit of, behind it. The second thing I'd like to say is formal surveys um, to their customers do occur, but most of their insights come from the dealerships themselves and some of the issues that they're actually experiencing because that's the, the customer for Toyota is actually not you or me, it's a dealership. That's who, the, that's who their end customer is. And that's how they, they maximize the value of it. Yeah. Okay, um, let me get to the final points here. and wrapping this up for today. And I, I appreciate all of your all's time. So let me go and sharing what final. Bam, okay. So what's the way forward? Um, let me just say, create a plan. You, in order to be resilient and, and reemerge stronger, you, you need to have laser focused objectives. And that's from the top down so that the bottom up initiatives have value, yeah? Get buy-in from your leaders, yeah? What I mean by getting buy-in from your leaders, get them involved. You know, my dad used to always say, if you do, if you do things in a vacuum, it'll suck. So if you do it by yourself and then give it to people, it isn't going to work. You got to, it's got to be collaborative. And that's why the Hoshin approach top down is so powerful because it's done together. Yeah. Um, have an integrated approach. Don't just do it uh, in one uh, area of the organization. Do it in all areas of the organization and use different, uh, different approaches for different issues. So you have a hammer, that's true, but then that's Kaizen. And then you have a sledgehammer and that's Kaikaku. And then you have Thor's hammer and that's Jishikin. So have, have a different kind of approach. Use technology to your benefit, but only where it benefits the end user. Yeah. Um, adaptability and scalability. Make sure that you know that your model needs to be able to change with the changing of times. And Toyota is really resilient at that. They're very resilient. That's why there's, they have adapted to the COVID uh, engagement uh, or the COVID uh, pandemic so well. Even though there's chip uh, issues out there and supply chain issues, they've adapted extremely well. And, and that's because they know how to, how to do that. And last but not least, invest. Invest in your people, in that talent, and, and get their capabilities and, and competencies up to a level that you can use people multiple times during the day on multiple different processes, multiple different functions. OK, it's ba it, it, it's bad enough that the Western world has put people in silos and said, you're an accountant and you're in debits for two years and you're going to do nothing but debits. You know, when they should be able to do credits, they should be able to do procurement functions and so on and so on. Yeah. So my strategy for moving that forward in the next 30, 60 days is go look at your strategic plan at the moment and link that to the lean optimization opportunities. Right. Direct linkage, and it needs to be directly um, uh, supporting the strategic perspective of the organization. You might want to be number one in the market. You're number two. You might want to, you know, have the best, um, you know, quality product recognized by some high-end, uh, you know, survey organization. Whatever it is, create that strategic imp imperative and link lean to it. That's what's important. And when I say lean, I'm really talking TPS uh, philosophies, principles, and practices. Um, Gain insights with digital solutions. What I mean by that, select something that in the, in the world of Industry 4.0 will make your business better for uh, the, the end user. So don't just incorporate technology because it's the latest fad, as I see happening in the pharmaceutical industry all, all the time. Go out there and get what's necessary for your business to make it better 
not just for today, but for the coming months and years. And last but not least, sharpen your saw with your capability to drive different activities within your organization. So TPS doesn't just do Kaizen. They do lots of problem solving. They do lots of in-process auditing. They do lots of talent development and competency. You know, you go into Toyota and you know, you're an engineer, you know, 20 years from now, if you follow this track, this is where you're going to be and you're going to be there. So create that kind of uh, uh, environment to where people feel comfortable that what they're learning and what they're growing with is actually helping not just themselves, but their organization. Obviously, focus on talent. I'll share this with, um, with uh, Yoshi-san, uh, this, this article that I, that I read last year in May about how you can adopt these six steps to reskilling your workforce. And I think it's a very powerful document that you guys can harness and, and make, make the most out. And last but not least, know that when you're really working on TPS, it's, it's truly 80% about the engagement of the people and 20% about the technical tools. The tools are there to change your behavior. They're not there to show you what's happening in the process only. It's there to change people's behavior. And I, and I hope we can go into London. I, I like to leave uh, today's session, if you don't mind, with uh, three major final thoughts. And first is think big. You want buy-in? If you haven't had buy-in for your transformation, for, for the way you're trying to make changes in your organization, then you need to think big. You need to think, what is the C-suite thinking? So cost reduction, revenue generation, that's going to get you buy-in, okay? And when you do that, be insistent, persistent, and consistent in your leadership drive of that transformation. The second thing that you need to do is make it real. Don't have this, you know, fluffy 10 goals out there. Have one. One goal that you want to attain and link everything to that, yeah? And have the bottom-up humility to go ask people questions. They have the answers. All the answers are at the Gemba. Whether that Gemba is in the virtual world or that Gemba happens to be in a physical world. All the answers are there. And you just need to engage the people in the right way to get that, those answers. And of course, keep it simple, right? The KISS principle. Last but not least, build capability. And I can't stress this enough. You need to build ambassadors within your organization for this transformation, for the adoption of these TPS kind of practices. And it's not through isolated activities. Everything in TPS is connected. Nothing is done by itself. 6S is not done or 5S or 3S is not done by itself. There's a purpose behind it. It's to solve a problem. It's to make things more visual. It's to be able to make it easier for people. They're all connected. Yeah. Um, and I, I stress also, learn from real competent people. There are so many people that are out there that are just, they're actually fl uh, flailing away. They read it in a book and they're trying it, you know. Um, go get people that actually have done things. And, and in that, I want to stress one other thing. Get somebody who's not in your industry. You want somebody who's never seen your process to help you make that process even better. So when somebody says, well, you know, how much experience do you have in the medical device industry? And I can say, you know, I've got eight years of experience. Oh, oh, you don't have 20, huh? You know, it doesn't matter. Always have that value though, okay? And last but not least, no sacred cows. Do it everywhere. Uh, the C-suite, the, the CEO's office, CEO's office, it's got to happen there as well as it has to happen in your supply chain, operations, back of the house, transactions, so on. No sacred cows. Do it everywhere. And that's it, my friends. So thank you for your time. And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm sure we ran out of time here, but I do hope that if you have any questions, you'll reach out to me or at least reach out to, to, to Yoshi-san or Nozomi-san, and we can get reconnected and, and answer your questions in that way. Uh, just remember, TPS takes, takes practice, not just understanding. You know, just because you, you know what it is doesn't mean, you know, practicality wise, how it actually is applied. So, again, arigatou gozaimasu. Uh, thank you for your time. Appreciate it. I'll stop sharing and turn it back to you, Yoshi-san. Great. Thank you so much, TJ-san. That, that was, uh, gosh, a uh, wonderful presentation. And as you promised, it was definitely interactive, right? So, thank you very much. And, uh you know, from standardized processing and uh, visualization, Kaizen and kind of, uh, you know, way forward. Uh, I think we learned so much, but I know that was just the surface too. So for all those tuning in and wanting to kind of learn more, I certainly encourage you to visute uh, DJ's website, MakotoFlow, uh, ltd.com. 
Uh, and then we will be sending out a survey as our way of doing some Kaizen and continuous improvement uh, about the, today's webinar. And uh, one of the questions will be if you wanted to uh, get in touch with DJ san yes, uh, for any uh, of your kind of more personalized uh, situation uh, and kind of ways to improve your business operations and your company's processes. Uh, uh, we'll certainly uh, offer that opportunity to connect with DJ Sun as well. Uh, but uh, thank you again, everyone, for joining us. DJ Sun, thank you so much for waking up early in the morning in Japan, being part of uh, today's webinar. Uh, and then, as Nozomi san mentioned earlier, uh, in the, today's program on uh, Kaizen and TPS, uh, we will have uh, two more programs uh, this year. We have another webinar coming up. And then, also to kind of uh, close us out about TPS, we'll have actually a virtual tour of a Toyota facility to kind of see how TPS is actually uh, in, uh, in motion. Uh, so thank you again, everyone, for joining us. Everyone stay safe, be healthy, and we'll see you next time. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you.